There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a short review of a short book that absolutely delighted me. Some Country Houses and Their Owners by James Lees Milne. A short little book put out by Penguin. It was a gift from my friend Leah who thought it might appeal to my bitchy, gay, gossip-loving self. And boy, was she ever right. James Lees Milne was an open... I don't know if he was openly gay, but he was a gay... <laughs> man. His life spanned most of the 20th century. He died in 1997 as a very old man. And he spent almost all of his working life working for the British National Trust. And I only vaguely understand what it is. And you don't need to understand it beyond the vagueness of my understanding to absolutely love this book. But the National Trust is a foundation where they take over country estates and stuff and keep them for the glory of the nation and open to the public. In the 30s and 40s, a lot of the nobility in England were having trouble paying for the upkeep of these grand manors throughout the UK and were interested in lending them, donating them, living in a small part of the house and having the National Trust run the rest and they could save on inheritance taxes. I don't know. It's probably much more complicated than that, but that's all I know. That's all you need to know unless you really want to know more about it. And James Lee's Milne, worked for the National Trust and he would go and visit all these people. He was vaguely connected through his family to many of them and he slept with most of the gay members of the nobility, which only comes out in this book in some of the recent introductions to his diary entries. There aren't a lot of salacious details other than him admiring a footman or two about his gay self, but these are extracts from his complete diaries. I think it's 10 volumes that is still apparently in print. I sure hope it is because I am going to read it from cover to cover based on how much I absolutely love this. I'm not interested in architecture. I'm interested in old houses. I'm interested in British history and the nobles, the dukes and whatnot to a certain degree. But I just fell in love with James Lee's Milne's bitchy. Uh, I mean, he was bitchy at times, but he either loved the people, the lords and dukes and duchesses, or he couldn't stand them, and he would tell all, with the discerning eye of a novelist, render his impressions of these often very eccentric people in his diary, and this is an excerpt thereof, and he would also describe and assess the architecture, the worth of these houses and their contents, and he didn't pull any punches in describing them either. That's all I'm going to say. I'm just going to read you two extracts, and if these extracts don't seduce you, then you don't want to read this book. But you don't need to hear me synopsize it anymore. Just listen. So they're arranged by the name of the property. So the first one that I'm going to share with you is Addingham Park in Shropshire. The date uh, under the title is the date that the National Trust acquired the estate. And the owner is Lord Berwick, who was dominated by his wife. And his wife was determined that he should leave the property to the National Trust. That's what the little introduction to this section. And then this is Lise Milne's diary entry from July 7th and 8th, 1943. Just listen to this. <laughs> from Evesham to Shrewsbury by train, changing at Hartlebury to the Severn Valley Line. What a beautiful valley it is, with gently sloping wooded banks and miniature scenery, even on a gray day. They, and so they is the Berwicks, right? They inhabit a fraction of the East Wing. The W-A-A-F's, I don't know, is that pronounced WAFs? And that is the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. The WAFs occupy the rest of the house. As a side note, this is often the state of affairs that Lise Milne would find the houses in. That during the Second World War, many of the noblemen, dukes and lords, gave their houses over for the war effort, and they were inhabited by wounded soldiers recovering, or in this case, the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, and so on. The WAFs occupy the rest of the house. The Ministry of Works has, at my instigation, protected the principal rooms by boarding up the fireplaces and even dados. The uniform Pompeian red of the walls is, I presume, contemporary. That is to say, late 18th century. In my bathrooms, the walls were papered with Captain Cook scenery, just like the upstairs bedroom at Laxton Hall, Northamptonshire. 
The first night we had champagne to celebrate Addingham's survival to date. After dinner I read through the 1827 sale catalogue of contents, many of which the third Lord Berwick, then minister to the court at Naples, bought from his elder brother, the second Lord. The following day Lady Berwick and I went to tea at Cronkill, one of the houses on the estate, built by John Nash in 1810. It was designed in the romantic style of an Italian villa, and is the precursor of many similar Victorian villas. Lady Berwick behaves towards her neighbours with a studied affability, a queenly graciousness which must be a trifle intimidating to those upon whom it is dispensed. After tea I walked with Lord Berwick in the Deer Park, having been enjoined by his wife to talk seriously about Attingham's future, and press him for a decision on various points. I did not make much progress in this respect. On the other hand, he expanded in a strangely endearing way. When alone, he loosens up and is quite communicative. He talked to me earnestly of the ghosts that have been seen at Addingham by the wafts. Lady Berwick would not have tolerated this nonsense had she been present. He kept stopping and anxiously looking over his shoulder, lest she might be overhearing him. But he did not stand stock still and resolve, which he does in the drawing room when she starts talking business. He told me that Lady Sybil Grant, his neighbour at Pitchford Hall, constantly writes to him on the forbidden subject, passing on advice as to health, which she has been given by her spiritual guides. She no longer dares telephone the information, for fear, so Lord Berwick asserted, of the spirits hearing and taking offence, but more likely for fear of Lady Berwick overhearing and strongly disapproving. He is not the least boring about his psychical beliefs, but is perplexed by the strange habits of ghosts. He asked me, did I think it possible that one could have been locked in the housemaid's cupboard? And why should another want to disguise itself as a vacuum cleaner? Really, he is a delicious man. <laughs> and here is some lesbian content. Rather scandalous, fascinating property and its inhabitants that he visits for the same purpose. Small Hythe Place in Kent which was acquired by the National Trust in 1938. When he visited it in 1942, so I guess it was after the, pro the property was acquired, it was lived in by the daughter of the actress Ellen Terry, and her daughter's name is Edith Craig. And Edith Craig was quite famous. She died in 1947 as an old lady. She was a theater director, producer, costume designer, and suffragist. And she lived in a menage a trois relationship for decades with the dramatist Christabel Marshall and the artist Claire Tony Atwood from 1916 until her death in 1947. So let's hear what James Lees Milnes makes of visiting these fascinating folk on the 26th of March 1942. Left for small height, Miss Edith Craig was in bed, but the other two odd old ladies were about, Christopher St. John and Tony, really Claire Atwood. They were dressed in corduroy trousers and men's jackets, one homespun, the other curry tweed. Their grey locks were hacked short and both wear tam shanters They were charming to me and gave me a huge two-handled mug of coffee. In Ellen Terry's little house, one feels that she might walk past one at any minute, and in her bedroom that she might appear sitting before her dressing table, brushing her hair. And then there's an editorial note that Edith Craig died in March 1947, and then this entry of Lees Milne's five years later on April 15th, 1947. I drove down to Kent, singing all the way as loudly as I could, on herd. Passed Knoll and lunched at Tenterden. At two o'clock, called it Small Height. The two poor old women remaining were very pathetic. Miss Atwood, aged 82, is the more spry and affable. Miss St. John, very lame, was wearing brown corduroy trousers stretched tight over an enormous bum, a yellow scarf around her neck, a magenta beret on her gray hair, shirt and tie. The other one wore a shirt and tie too, and is called Tony by her friends. Miss St. J is called Chris. They showed me over the property and explained its problems. In the fairy cottage lives a terrifying woman who helps them with the housework. She wears grey flannel trousers, tight shirt and tie, and beret, and is grubby and masculine. She is called Bruce, and refers to Miss St. John as Mr. Chris. Really, I felt like 
Alice in Wonderland. Oh my god. So now I just want to reread the whole book from start to finish. Check it out. It's just wonderful.